Welcome back to Dr. Bruce. This second audience Q&A session for Ojai Salon number two, which was podcast 13 here in the Levity Zone, returns to a key theme for how we might reinvent a beautiful world by the year 2050. Central to that vision is the re-centering of civilization on the feminine. Journey back to the stone room in Ojai in June of 2013 and witness the weaving of that story together by Sarah, Dennis, Jeff, and myself, Dr. Bruce, as we explore the rise of the feminine in the West. We jump from the 21st century in Europe where women's power is returning the strongest, all the way back to the shores of southern Africa, where the male manic monkey may have been born in the very hearth and home of mitochondrial Eve, our common mother. We're back online here, continuing. And the, the good news is, it's a haphazard process, but the feminine is coming alive in the West. The feminine is so much stronger yes. now than it was 50 years yes. ago. We know this. We can feel it. I feel it inside myself. I feel a feminine side to me. And, you know, I'm very happy to have it in me and that I can express it. And the feminine is coming alive all over the place. If you notice the pattern, you were talking about the feminine, if you notice the pattern that there are more women in politics and more and more women in Congress, and I saw that group photograph. It was amazing. Mm. And for the first time, for the first time in the last two months, I felt all of a sudden that the men saw that these ideas, all this crazy stuff, they're talking about abortion, and I don't know, whatever, all this stuff, that, that, that they were really threatened by the women. Mm -hmm. And did you, I mean, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Kirsten Gillibrand from New York State. She's a senator from New York State. And she took on the whole military-industrial complex mm. on this whole rape issue. Mm. And, I mean, she was so tough at all the other oh, members. Oh, I heard her interview, yeah. Yeah, and then, wow. you know... It was really powerful. And then the, 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 the whole brass, they were all in there, oh, you know, all their... They were like in a hearing. And they were in a row. There were like 30 of them. <laughs> and she stood them, and she was mm -hmm. so disappointed when ultimately... Just like the financial laws, you know, they took all the guts out of it. Yeah. And the guts were that they wanted business as usual, basically. What they wanted is they wanted to be in charge. They want total power. That to me, is... this was symbolic. This has not happened before. They couldn't believe this was happening. Wow. But there were enough women that supported her in doing that. And, of course, some of the better um, men that were in Congress, that this happened. No, and I think this that's... speaks to Dennis's comment a little bit, maybe, or Dennis's point of view a little bit, because he pointed out, I think, very importantly, that it has to be on a very solid footing, this solution, because otherwise, I would say, otherwise it'll just be sort of absorbed, you know, and incorporated and become part of the problem. And if this divine mother, if you want to call it this presence, this one mother, mm. if, if the genetics that we inherited from her have as one of their features the continuing of a dominance hierarchy, and that we're genetically programmed to replicate dominance hierarchies, if we're genetically programmed to be that and we way, may not, how we may one not ever be. hope I mean, we have, to, we have to know what we're up against. You know, I hate to bring up democraticunderground.com, but the things like what you're talking about are posted there. You have no idea the great things that are posted there. And one of the things I saw was like a recording or a video hmm. of these people and the civilization someplace in the South Seas that hmm. live like they did thousands of years ago and it's the only one in the world. But it, it was the most phenomenal thing to watch. So they're, they're kind of evidence that it's a uh, nurture. And in fact, yes, you, could, you could have an experiment where you would say, you know, we're taking this island of people. Aldous Huxley wrote a book called Island, where this is actually the case. So the, the island of people, the adults are like, we're not going to live the way we are. We're going to raise our children differently. And within one generation, 
they're a civilization that's not patriarchal, it has no war. You know, this is a great book, it's written in the 1960s, and Island is about this place that was 100% uh, nurture, it wasn't in the, in the genes to be this way. There, uh, there's a woman, I forget her name, who wrote a book called The First Sex, and it's part of the feminist impetus. Oh, and who wrote that? I know that. Yeah, she, yeah. she travels around and talks a lot. And, uh, but she, her point of her book was that women, as you mentioned, are moving more and more into uh, the professions and the workforce. And as the economy turns into a service economy, women are better adapted at that. Their brains are, are multiphasic, and they're also uh, better communicators with. Mm -hmm. And so the whole uh, demographic is really going to change as mm -hmm. women move into the into the culture more and more. Hopefully, they so do. So why the suppression? I mean, why do we have because, all these men oh, up there going blah 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 blah? If women can why. speak so much better. Because whenever um, whenever something's coming to an end, before it comes to an end, it comes goes to the way it's stream. Right. That's that's what cuts it off. That's what ends it. The shouting, the, the shouting happens. is loudest before the. <laughs> that's no. yeah. So 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 the thing about the, the feminism, when that started, it was kind of very dramatic, and then it calmed down in a way. But yeah, that that's what I feel. In fact, I thought it was kind of a good time. I figured all these crazy pieces of legislation. What did somebody say that that wonderful governor of Michigan, that woman governor, she's not governor anymore. What did you say there's something like, like 60 pieces of legislation that Republicans proposed that were about all this kind of crazy stuff? And they were against women, you know? And, and it's like, they're just on this, they're just on this free-for-all to just do whatever they can. It's like they're glass gas. Mm -hmm. That's what I think, I saw it that way when I first heard about well, it. Well, a good example of all this is what happened to Europe. So Europe was the original home of human beings after we left Africa. Uh -huh. So Europe was the place where you know, we met our, our Neanderthal cousins and we bred with them and all that, but the Neanderthal were one of the last lines that were not us. Uh, but then we built our first hunter-gatherer village cultures, big cultural things in Europe. And so, but Europe has been a battleground, a major battleground. I mean, the fellow that they found, the ice man up in the Austrian Alps, they found frozen into the ice. I mean, he had been dinged in the back of the head and murdered by somebody way the heck up in the Alps. And he was a traitor or something. They found this pouch and all this stuff. But someone had offed this man. Mm. This is a long time ago. It's, so Europe's been this battleground. So what happens in the 20th century? Europe goes through a convulsion of two major wars. You could actually include the War of 1870 in, in that, maybe three major wars, where it probably learned its lesson. And the last one, the, the very patriarchal World War II, Europe's cities were in ruin. I mean, it was a major catastrophe, and the Europeans finally said, you know what, we can't go back. We can't do this. Now they're caught in the Iron Curtain thing and whatever, but that, that went away. And what did Europe do? It extended itself. And when I was living in Prague in the early 1990s, the war in Yugoslavia exploded. And watching this thing, I was interviewing a Serb war refugees for programming jobs in Prague in 1992 and 93. It was this kind of a freaky thing. I went to, to Yugoslavia to get a sense of this. And my European friends, they said, you know, we see what's going on in, in Srebrenica and places like that. That's us 50 years ago. You're looking in the mirror. That's what all of Europe looked like in 1945 with pogroms and destroyed villages. And the European, the whole European psyche was just shocked. Oh my God, that's what oh, we, that's what we escaped, that tribal and then we war. we created that here. Well, but here's the, the hopeful thing. Europe created the European Union. And this was done on purpose to prevent another European war. The first thing they did was unify the steel industry between France and Germany. So it was one. So that the, the chance of building armaments to fight between those two great combatants was kind of eliminated. They had a single steel industry. This was an architecture that was done. And so now what is Europe? It has its problems with finance and stuff. But how many European countries are headed by women? A lot. Right. And how women are in the workforce. They're a major 
power. So Europe simultaneously got through its military industrial complex, its kings, its potentates, its, its standing armies, and women moved in to be a major force economically and politically across all 30 countries. Mm-hmm. And so Europe, being our original home out of Africa, may be the most advanced place on the planet. That's what I see now. Yeah. The overall trend is astounding. And what's also happened in, in Europe is the great churches, the Catholic churches, has so little power in Europe. I when I went to Portugal, I had a girlfriend in Portugal, and I went in the mid-1990s. She said, you know what, 15 years ago, when we moved from Canada back to Portugal, the churches were full of people. Now no one goes to church. What are they going to do with all those big cathedrals? Well, it's like Roman Catholicism has a massive patriarchal, corrupted, and discredited force, and no one cares anymore in Europe. It has basically collapsed in Europe. And, you know, with the rise of all these terrible scandals with the abuse of children in places where it had a foothold, like Ireland, it's now just discredited. So Mm -hmm. even that patriarchal structure, it has virtually no influence in that society. So it's now, of course, it's building its populations in the developing world. Yeah, I haven't been there for a while, but I've heard such incredible things. I saw a video, which is a video of a Norwegian prison. Hmm. You should see this prison. And they talk about how that they want a uh, good society, so when they bring these people in, they want to rehabilitate them, mm. and, and they, so they, get, they teach them things, they have schools, yeah. Yeah. And, and the inside of the prison looked like, uh, I mean, it was beautiful. And the, you know, the Dutch are closing prisons because they have so fewer prisoners are actually starting to shut them down, so... They don't want angry people to go back into society. Yeah, they've learned, the, sense. They've learned the common sense, yeah. So in a sense, this, this 2050 vision partly is inspired by what's going on in Europe because oh. they're implementing pieces of this. I mean, Denmark is up to 20% of its power from wind now. I mean, they, they are doing it. I mean, they're doing it against a lot of odds too, but gosh bless the, the British, Europeans. The British are kind of going along with us though, aren't they? No, no, I mean, it's all a big trend. I mean. I did my PhD degree in, in Ireland and in England, and I traveled extensively over Europe in the last four or five years, and it's astonishing, the change. And I went to Europe first in 1981, and lived in Prague when the Berlin Wall fell. I lived in Prague from like 1990 to 94, and that was an incredible change. Here you had a society that was traumatized, full-on trauma. And they rebuilt themselves. They lifted themselves up. Huh. They cleaned up their cities of the pollution. Uh, they built new lives. They got way too busy, uh, but they rebuilt their country. And one of the little towns where we hired computer programmers, when I went back in 1997, because we had started our little software lab in Prague, the guy said, you know what? The frogs are back. For 50 years, we've never heard frogs in the streams around our town of Zichani because of the pollution from pesticides in centrally planned agriculture. That all changed, and there's birds and frogs back that we remember, that our parents remember. So things are getting a lot better. It's cleaner. So Europe is maybe leading the planet. And you know, know, what I love is the way the European Union has, you know, because of the bees, they, 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 they just told Monsanto they want no part of their genetically modified foods. They don't want anything part of it. Um, Dennis, uh, I'm excited by the recent comment that you made. You made, you made, um, and I'd like to put in a plug for uh, philosophy here in European feminist philosophers. I've, I've been reading them, and it's exciting. Um, starting with Simone de Beauvoir, 1949, Second Sex, and then uh, some people that have come after. So, I, I personally am taken with these some of these. Uh, contemporary women philosophers, because uh, part of my thinking is that philosophy is the uh, queen of the sciences, mm. uh, because it's the broadest in scope. And I think you, you mentioned uh, language. Uh, it's not that uh, women's language is, is better than man's, it's just different. So both types of languages, mm. uh, men are m- more focused and linear, women are more multi Basically, from their background, but both are important. But mm-hmm. uh, what kind of turns me on at the moment is the deep. You mentioned in your presentation the deep questions 
are what we need to address in the deep problems. Otherwise, as, as, as you said, uh, we won't get any traction if you don't address the, the substantial issues. And one of those would be uh, philosophy, and the other is, is politics, of course. And you mentioned earlier that you feel that when males start hunting animals, that that was maybe the starting well, point? Well, yes, it would take me too long a time here for the time we have here to go into it, because there's a lot to it. But in essence, uh, yes, it was in patriarchal men. And the patriarchal element has always been with us, but it's been properly mitigated in, in nature. Now, there has always been a violent factor, the killing you mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's always been present, but... But the women had the power in the communities. Well, yes, in, in our species, it, it was the, the women who were the natural leaders, because they had the power of birth, they had the power... Of, their sexual capacities are five or six times greater than a man's just by counting the nerve endings or something, you know, and, and their whole body gets involved in the sex act and so on. So the women were the natural leaders, and the men were actually the helpers, which is the inverse of what the Bible, as one patriarchal text, has it. It's, it was God created a woman to be the helper to man. It's actually the reverse. Mm -hmm. Nature's way of doing it is, the, mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a man who is, who is a mature man has no problem with this. He's delighted to to be the helper to the to the to the woman-based society, the woman and her child, the man is part of that system, and in that system, uh, which was highly sexual, open, communal, uh, non-discriminatory, and all that, men had all the sex they could possibly want, because it takes about four men to satisfy one woman sexually. Mm. There's a lot more to the story, but basically, a patriarchal man who might be the, the mad monkey type you're describing becomes jealous of that, of that woman-based system. And he acquires the power to overcome that system by a different type of bloodletting than the monthly menstruation, where a woman bleeds and does not die. And men, in order to acquire that blood power, because the power is in the blood, began to kill animals to acquire that blood, because you get a blood rush from hunting. Hmm. You bond with other fellow people and you build up, you bulk up. In fact, men today, their blood count is significantly higher than women's, despite the fact that women bleed monthly. Hmm. Now that fact should be explained, and my explanation for it is that men were bulked up because of their hunting and eating meat. A oh, woman, uh, yeah, a woman, meat yeah, a woman naturally, because of the fact that she gives birth and she nurses the baby, does, is not inclined to kill other life like that. Hmm. Men right. is not so close to that life source, so men acquired their power by killing the animals. There's a bloodlust thing. And then they, from there, they began their war against women and then led to other men. Hmm. Hmm. So the basic problem in our, in our culture today is actually a war between the sexes. Hmm. Men uh, forcefully and violently overthrew the original love culture which was based on women, mm -hmm. then, only then, as a retaliation and a response to patriarchy, was types of a matriarchy created, where women become aggressive against the men. So then, you, but there was no matriarchy before patriarchy, in my theory. But my theory is spelled out in the various writings of the, of the love government, and that's the information that I'm putting forward. But I need to get feedback from groups mm -hmm. like yourselves to test my theory. It has to be tested scientifically, as you mentioned. Uh, this stuff has to be solidly grounded in science, not just uh, clinical well, science. Because without that, without what that, we're left with you know, is this constant, and I've been doing this since I was 16 years old, sitting in rooms like this mm -hmm. for 35 years, mm -hmm. uh, telling these stories and asking these same questions. and the trauma of where we've come from, mm -hmm. and the, the confusion, and the anger, the sadness, yeah. the grief, all of these things seem to be almost insurmountable because there's this, seems to be this deep-seated desire to try to get to this catharsis. We haven't know, got to try to keep yeah. kind of telling these yes, stories yes, because there's something in us that needs to come out 
it needs to be spoken, it needs to be heard, it mm -hmm. needs to be exactly. somehow, and I want to be very supportive of doing whatever's necessary if this process of this storytelling may be drawn to a sort of a conclusion where we can take a sort of a final analysis mm -hmm. and a final stock of say, okay, this is what happened, this is where we've come from, um, this is where we find ourselves, and to get on with the business of visioning this mm. bright future that can be the result of this, where everyone has an opportunity to finally be heard, to tell their story, mm -hmm. and to be validated in it, to be supported in it, to be nurtured and held and whatever it is required to finally get it out so we can say okay because otherwise it's just this recapitulation of this thing where it's it's like this this syndrome where it's constantly being reactivated but not kind of fully spit up you know that it's sort of caught there so we are getting gradually to the mega story the grand narrative mm -hmm. and we get to that the wheels are going to touch solid ground and you're going to get traction. Mm -hmm. uh, when, that, when that story appears once again, which is the original story, mm -hmm. it, will, it, will re, it will connect with the future and the past. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the original story will, will, will take on a, 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 a life that makes sense. And then, then you will have a, a, a true story. But along with the story has to go certain practices to uh, concretize or to ground the story. In other words, if we keep doing the same things, the definition of craziness is do the same things over and over, expecting a different result. So I've identified five actions, five very concrete uh, applications to the theory, and this is what's so, going to be so popular, because mm. it goes directly against the culture. As long as people are eating the food they're eating, I don't I think there's, there's any hope. I mean, this is really serious. Uh, and I think that's what the military industrial complex is about. It's that food people have been eating for so long. Mm. That's the meat that has all the hormones in yeah. it and the stuff in those drinks and the alcohol, the whole thing. All you, together. you mentioned poverty it's with the diet. It's making people violent, making people horrible. Diet is changing the constitution of people. You mentioned poor people, right? Bad right. diet, didn't you say that? Well, and they're eating corporate food. That's all they can afford. Corporate food. See, this is, this is changing our constitution. So we can't think clear anymore. Do you, have you ever listened to Gary Knoll? Do you know who Gary Knoll is? Mm -hmm. Well, you really, that would be really good. He's, for the last 40, 50 years, he's written all kinds of books on, on health. And he exposed the pharmaceutical companies 20 years ago. He was exposing them. No, he's amazing, and you can look on his website and listen to him. He has a radio program from New York City. So I really enjoyed this. It was really Thank nice you to meet for you. coming, Sarah. Thank you so much. Kind of pulled us out of the uh, no, out of the, I mean out of the pit here because we needed a third voice, and so you, I, you I, were I, it. I know it was really, really fascinating. Good luck with what you're doing. Have you written any books about this? No, I haven't done. Um, well, that would be good. I think out of all these conversations, a book could rise, but it would probably be a collaborative book with people who've been in the conversations. Uh huh. Uh huh. Because then it would. Well, it was really nice sense. to meet both of you. Sure, thank you for coming. So nice. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Oh, thank I enjoyed you. it. It's great. Thank you. Good. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I'm telling a story. Yeah. Well, government is actually part of this. It's a story with pictures. I used the Tarot deck, the Universal Weight Tarot deck, but with a radical interpretation. This core group of, of women, uh, yeah, that's where my, my uh, story begins. Hmm. With the women. With the core group. With the core group of women. Uh, that's the way I see the, the, the our origination as a species was uh, with a, a single mother and then uh, the community. It was women at the core of it. So you can imagine these yeah, the, women, right. the, the, the mutation, and yeah. they're yeah. they're talking, and they're like, suddenly we're a lot smarter, but we're not going to be stupid about it. And we're going to build civilization from this point on. And these men were still sending them out to do their stuff. But probably they had their way for quite a long time after that. But then the out-of-control teenage hunter boys went and slaughtered a, a sacred animal. 
one day and they got disciplined by the women because this was the wrong thing to do. Mm-hmm. And you know, you could tell that as like a as allegorical story. Mm-hmm. That this this initial discipline and then then the rise of this anger and this power and jealousy that they had killed a sacred ibex or something mm-hmm. from South Africa, one of these beautiful ibex. Is that where these myths like the gold the goose the, the, that laid the golden egg kind they of got kind killed. Of, yeah. But then they, 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 these boys come back and they've killed this sacred animal. And it's at that moment that the manic split occurs. Because they're, they're rejected completely. So they go into this hurt phase. Mm-hmm. And they do something to the community that changes the dynamic. Oh, that's the story of that telling. Yeah. Oh, almost. Almost, yeah. Almost, but, you're, but that, yours is a little... Is that the story you tell? I just this came out of me right now. Yeah, it might be a yours is for... yours is beautifully a little more uh, uh, killing the sacred animal. Yeah. The sacred, the ibex, the African. Yes, yes. Uh, the the what do they call them? I saw one in South Africa. It's fantastic horns and and they're very rare. The yeah, kudu. Yeah. Kill you know, the sacred animal. They kill the sacred animal. And they brought it back, and this is a very small community of the proto-humans that had survived the genetic thing. Right. It's growing yeah. again, That's what I, yeah. but then, and they're moving back into the hunting grounds, and they're moving off of a marine diet, because the marine diet probably fed that community and, and that, that mutation, and the shellfish diet is incredibly good for you. Yeah, it's and got, the clams are the <clears throat> highest in B12, and they've got these minerals, and it's really... So you can imagine that this community yeah. was driven out of East Africa by desertification and by an incredibly terrible climate and by the interstitial wars. It hits South Africa, it hits the Durban, KwaZulu-Natal coast, where they found this cave. And it, become, it finds the richest diet, much richer. And so then the prototypical mother of us all is born in this cave. They have the best diet and then they radiate back north. They leave that Eden. That was the Eden of intelligence and a correct diet and a relationship with the mother of all mothers is the ocean. This is the first time the primate oh, the primates sense. became yeah. uh, connected with the ocean ever because they were forest yeah. of origin. And then as they move into basically what's now the Kruger National Park area, KwaZulu Natal, they uh, return to the hunting tradition. And these boys that are born of this great mother are different. So they have maybe the manic part, maybe they're different hunters. So they weren't hunters, they were shellfish gatherers and fishermen. And fishermen are almost always peaceable people all over the world. They're peaceable people because they have to deal with this ultimate in power in nature, which is the sea. The sea. Yeah. And, and so they're, they tend to be mostly peaceful. And it has a calming influence because it, you're sort of rocked. Yeah, you're and rocked. That, and mm-hmm. it, it kind of like... And it's a gift to you. you. Kind of like, and there's a, you're involved in its rhythm. Yeah. Because of the rising and falling of the tides. And, so when, and you're in touch with the, you know, and you have, the, to have your wits yeah, about, about you. About, so you're up against something greater than you. It's like all the things that... A human being seems to need yeah. to it helped contain, to go up again. It contained the nature of these proto boys, and so when the community, for whatever reason, had to leave the seashore, it was out competed by a, le- a more violent but less developed hominid line, and they ran for the interior. They were thrown back into this, the hunter gatherer, which the women could do just fine, but now the boys went out and they killed the sacred kudu. And it happened after they left the... After the, the tip, seashore area. After the seashore. And then yeah. they, see, they radiated over hundreds of thousands of years. Our line radiated back through East Africa, back north and then into Europe. And we were constantly being driven by some force, whether it be climate, competition, and we were driven out of Africa. And we were driven into Europe. But by the time we got to Europe, we were... Uh, becoming a patriarchal. Uh, I think I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to. I'm feeling the need to revise my story a little bit, based on what you're telling me. It's metaphorical. Bit. There's a certain beauty to it. Yeah, it's a very <clears throat> beautiful thing. I I base my story uh, 
in East Africa near Lake Victoria, which is another water. Yeah, so there are probably water. a lot of fish there. They, but, but that would have been uh, subsequent to being down at the tip. Yeah, so actually they would have come through that area again. Again, but there was, a, there was some kind of a driver that was pushing our ancestors to get out of Africa. It was some, Africa had become a very difficult place to be. Yeah, it was war probably, and they were following the animals. They had, after the killing of the sacred uh, the kudu, the kudu, and then it became habit, and they uh, they got addicted to it, uh, meat, uh, killing and meeting and eating is addictive, I think, and so they, as they killed the animals off, hmm. they um, just like the native peoples killed all the megafauna in North America before, long before the Europeans arrived. I, I, I got that from uh, Diamond Jared. Jared, Jared, Diamond. Jared Diamond, yeah. He said in that 1,000 years they went from the Bering Strait all the way down to the tip of South yeah. America. And then Easy. The, yeah. the large animals, they the killed, animals them. killed them all. Killed all off. Off. Cut down all. the trees. Yeah, too. they started fires and burned across them. Just, uh, wow. It was real carnage. Whoa, well, they must have been tough sons of bitches. So East <laughs> Africa would have been a similar, <laughs> so as, as the, yeah, the manic yeah. males manic fanned males, out yeah. and destroyed the East African savanna and pushed north and yeah. carried their community, so, so then degraded the original structure and yeah. the mothers could not control it. And no. What was driving them, uh, and uh, to me it was, it, was, it was the killing and the meat eating. I was driving it, and they, in the meantime, they got more and more beefed up, developed upper body strength. Mm. The men, you know, mm -hmm. their blood count rose, and it's gone on from there. And then they they crossbred with Neanderthal in Europe, um, oh, and and then no. the European Is culture. Is there alcohol present in that culture? Is there some type of fermented? Not until drink. Uh, twenty thirty thousand. But what happened in Europe? Here's the thing. When they hit Europe, they slammed straight into advancing ice sheets, which meant they had to kill more animals for the for the fur and First, protection, yeah. the mm -hmm. warmth, to and they so survived, they, they actually, in a sense, donned animal uh, skins mm -hmm. and animals spirits to survive. So it was a whole other era, an epoch. Yeah. And then they painted the animals in the hunt, and yeah. and uh, then we have the Ice Man and the Alps getting. His head busted yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. There's always been a killing. I mean, I, I think that uh, looking at it a very, in a very broad picture, uh, nature is violent. There's a violent part of nature, you know, even in the galaxies and so on. And the, hmm. uh, so it's way, I mean, it's, it's endemic in, into our particular reality. But the violence is mitigated over long periods of time, so it's, it's reasonable violence. Yeah, the, the destructiveness seems to be a part of a kind of a self-managing yeah. type of a... Like, and for, you know, for lion, example, a lion... lion will, they'll, kill, they'll, kill. they'll kill the newborns to kind of like, so the population stay in balance. Yeah, it's a balance. So yeah. the, really, the really. resources aren't overtaxed. And, yeah. and the, the lion you know, will kill the sick. Yeah, the weakest, the the zebra, the weakest, yeah, so and then you see them having eaten the zebra, and they're lying around, and the zebra are all around them, at the watering hole, just standing around doing their thing. Oh, because it's, <laughs> it's right. The violence has been done, and it's, it's been done because it's prescribed. Because it's, it's prescribed. It's, it's, yeah. it's not this. Yeah. It's not yeah. wanton. It's yeah, not right. wanton. exactly. You know, it's, 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 it's there's it. a me it's part of a method. method. Yeah, <laughs> right. Method of, yeah, and we we can't necessarily say that we're any different. Than that, we just happen to need a lot more management because and, we're so out of control. And so we're so <laughs> over the because we've been so successful. Yeah. If we have peaceable living within our own community group, we have a stronger community and better reproductive possibility. When our community group starts to war within itself, if the whole group could be wiped out, the whole genetic line could be wiped out. So there is actually a natural selection force to have peaceability within a social a social animal. Mm -hmm. And to also defend your line against other communities within the group. Yeah, right. yeah. Wars within groups—they're not good markers for continuing that your genetic line, because suddenly now you're weakened. Um, well, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at the massive influx, for example, of people coming here from Mexico, 
Like when that happened in other countries historically, there would be major conflicts over that. Like people wouldn't typically allow yeah. that kind of a that would be viewed as an invasion by our counterparts, you and I, mm -hmm. in this area. But now we're sort of like, well, okay, whatever, let them come. It's like we become, in a sense, much more easygoing. Like you pointed out, we're less violent. But the result of that is, is that the dominator now will use that easygoingness as a way to manipulate their own agenda here's, and here's exert the, their own kind of efforts. And now one. you see the entire country is being like totally whacked out of balance way radically. Here's a great one that you could include in another phase of your story. So there was a group going to Kazakhstan, this is in, in the 90s, to get blood samples from regions of Central Asia. They came back, they sent the samples to London, the genetic tester there said, you have to have made a mistake in taking all these samples. Well, we can't. We were at this village and we went over here and everyone was quite happy mm -hmm. to give us samples. We're trying to find out your history. She said, no, because there's the same mutation in all these blood types. And they go, ah, we may have found Genghis Khan. So they expanded the study and they found that there are 16 million direct descendants of Genghis Khan, the most successful fathering figure <laughs> in history. When, when Genghis Khan left Mongolia with his armies, they would find a village, kill all the men, and then he would take all the young girls and they would go on. And he, he fathered, now, today, living 16 million people. It is proof, it is absolute proof. So you look at the, the change of the culture of Central Asia from that one event that all the extant towns and tribes and everything are pretty much wiped out. The male lines are wiped out and replaced by this one hyper-patriarchal male that ends up you know, meeting his death. The, the, the legend is that a woman during lovemaking killed him somewhere almost like in Europe and stopped this. She killed him off. But... Think of that. I mean, that's the ultimate expression of male power. And they were killing females also in the community. They would have killed off the entire genetic load of that community and replaced it. So, another chapter to your story. Yeah, another part of the story. Yeah. And so, rewinding, I mean, that's probably one of the extremes of patriarchal expression and killing and meat and blood expression ever that happened. That's only a thousand years ago. That's recent history. And that, that was in the pinnacle of this, if you wanted to take a marker. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. 16 million offspring. So if you get your genetic testing done there, it's like a little section like related to Genghis Khan. A lot of people are finding they are. They're Genghis Khan's offspring. Gen Gen so Genghis they, they, Khan. They, they, they trace the genes back to a specific it individual. To, it's one mutation. It had to come from one father. One father, it's like the great mother. I mean, this was a, it was one father. It had to be. So, <laughs> stretching from China all the way to, like, the Danube, practically, to, to Europe. I mean, uh, the, the borders and the marshes of, of Moldova. There's more offspring of Genghis Khan. That's incredible. Incredible stuff. So that's scientific... Uh... Yeah, it's one. Uh, the, 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 you can trace it to one individual. One father. One mother or one father. One father in this case. It was a male. Yeah, kind in of this case, yeah. Mutation, and they're now trying to find the body to find any genetic material that might survive. His nobody knows where Genghis Khan is buried, but his son went on to be the emperor of China. So it's like they could find anything, they find any genetic material, they can validate this. But <laughs> it's pretty much, that's the only way this could have happened. <laughs> Wow, isn't that amazing? So directly he may have fathered thousands of offspring in his lifetime. And, and these guys didn't live till their 80s, right? <laughs> they, yeah, yeah. they started early, probably when they were 16 or 18, and like Alexander, and then they just cranked it out until their earlier 40s, and then they finally got offed either by somebody or by disease or something. <laughs> you broke a leg and you died of infection within a few days. That yeah. conclusion also applies to a common mother, huh? Yeah. One single, one single mother. Probability, huh? 
It's guaranteed. Guaranteed certain, yeah. Guaranteed certain. It's as great as the discovery that the universe is expanding faster. Like, this is one of those fundamental discoveries of, mm -hmm. ha, we came from a single female. Now, because everyone's getting their genetic testing done, there's a firm now that's going to do it for 99 bucks. Oh, is that 23 and me? <clears throat> and that's, that's started by a friend of mine is a friend of the wife of one of the Google founders, and it's her company. They live up in our area. 23 and Me, the company. They just got like $50 million of investment. So now they're going to lower their price to 99 bucks. So all over the planet, people, they spit into a tube, send it through the mail, and then six weeks later you get a URL that you log in. It's all there. The drugs you should never take, the drugs that will never work for you, the higher propensity for certain diseases. There's more of an emphasis on your on, uh, personal disease health, related, right? Personal now. analytics. And then they show you this map of where your ancestors on your mother and your father's side went out of Africa. Like my mother's side, there's blotches of color through Arabia and then it swings around and goes up into Lapland or something. And my father's side, the blotches of the migrants go right into Southern Europe and I've got a big Irish component. So I never knew this, this is why I talk so much. But so it's like, wow, I'm, I'm over the average in Neanderthal. And you can buy a t-shirt, you know, Neanderthal and proud of it. And it shows a guy walking with a club. You know, <laughs> I have 3.6% Neanderthal. And the average Indo-European is like 2.9% Neanderthal gene. So as this is coming in, <laughs> Neanderthal, all this is now, it's showing where the radiations occurred of the populations. And so they can take all this genetic material and sort of work it backwards through time, because there's a certain mutation rate. This is how they do early life on Earth paleontology, like the first swimming thing originated far earlier than the first fossil that was found of a swimming thing. So the first swimming thing probably was seven or 800 million years ago, not 600, which is the first fossil evidence of mm -hmm. things that moved and dragged in the mud. <laughs> and so they do the same thing with humans and like, where did we branch off? You know, where was the Ur mother? <laughs> and they found bones of 55 million year old primate Ur ancestor that was no more than a couple of inches long, that we lived in the rainforest canopy on limbs, and we hunted insects and we sucked tree sap to get high on sugar and we ate leaves. So we had a burger, fries, and, uh, and <laughs> shake <laughs> diet. And, and, and yet, our ancestors that were living tree-born were around before the impact at Chichlub where the, the bull-eyed asteroid blasted a hole in the crust and burned the planet. And so the talk I gave to the women at the Women's Visionary Congress was all about life. How did the mother forest, who picked us to replace the dinosaur, we were the next favorite. She fell in love with us because she could see through our eyes and we were the first animals with binocular color vision. So she could see herself for the first time, <laughs> see the stars. So she ordered this asteroid impact to allow us to go forward. But then at the last minute, thought, what have I done? <laughs> because the, the asteroid impact she ordered was too powerful, it was a big hit. So if you, if you think of the guy and mother as this entity, sitting in the rainforest saying, here comes my asteroid, I can get, finally get rid of these dinosaurs. And she sees this sheet wall of two miles in height of magma rising because the asteroid bursts through the crust. <laughs> but then she sees the terrifying mistake, which is this globule 50 miles across of molten material, the droplet, rising to orbit because the impact's too big. So... This droplet is basically, she's fucked. Because this droplet breaks up into the shower of like hot sperm, basically, that will slam back down thousands of mountain-sized molten blobs that burn the atmosphere and burn all the forests and boil off 30 feet of the ocean. So as the world goes dark, she says, what was I thinking? <laughs> I'm trying to allow these tiny proto-primates to get through, and they live in the rainforest canopy, and now raining down upon them are these 
these these things. And and so the earth is burned. I mean, within 24 hours, the surface temperature is 500 degrees. It's worse than a nuclear winter. And so what happens is dinosaurs don't make it through, blah, blah, blah. And within several million years, you know, the atmosphere is cleared and forest covers the planet from head to toe. The, the forest surges back, and so the madre comes back up to consciousness, and we've made it through. We made it through that. How did we make it through that? We know that happened. How? So here come the bolides, and they're, they're exploding in the atmosphere. It blows the colony of tiny little insectivore primates. It blows them out of the canopy and onto the forest floor. Logs are falling, and there's burning, and... How on earth did we make through that thing? When every living dinosaur, probably with the exception of birds, you know, you're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of species yeah. in all ecosystems, they didn't make it, and we did. We were so frail and fragile and little, and and so that's another part of the miracle story of of uh, why we're still here. It's an allegorical story about the Madre comes back to consciousness and we've we've made it through. The Madre was that? Uh, that's the the mother. Of, oh, the mother. Uh, all life on Earth. Okay, yeah. Mostly plant. So when I was in the Amazon rainforest, I had a conversation, which is the two podcasts ten and eleven. When you go to the left, oh, yeah, they're yeah. my conversation with the Amazon rainforest. Careful of the labels you use in the storytelling. Mm. Matriarchy, I don't think, is a good label. Mm. That's, a, that's a form of, it's a reaction in the form of patriarchy. Some other word needs to describe the feminine power that they have. Some other word. It's, uh, I call lover, loverarchy. Loverarchy. That's what I, my word, but I don't believe there was ever a matriarchy prior to patriarchy. Matriarchy would imply a power over. Right. And if you don't want that, it wasn't never, that was not true. But if you use a label like that, you're going to falsify it. Something they, were, like they were like a communion, you know. Yeah. They were the center of the community, and yeah. they were the center of the community. Common archy or something. See, it was a common, yeah. Archy. See, archy is, a, you, know, you know, I'm sure, archy is a Greek word meaning first principle, first cause, mm -hmm. most important value, like an arc, archy, archy. Mm -hmm. So patri is the father becomes that. But prior to that, it was not a mate, it was not a mother. She didn't operate in that in that manner of power over. It was a community. The, the grand story, the grand the story. narrative, is what's going to turn this around. Yeah. If you can create the story, you can turn it around. Common people will get it. They will. They will understand it through a story. They, they will understand the philosophy or the or the propaganda. They don't. It just confuses them. Yeah. Pure story. You get a pure, consistent, coherent story that makes sense to them, everything will fall into place. It's told from the heart and, and from, from the, the mind, yeah. in yeah. care and love, and in then, person, or as a conversation. Exactly. And yeah. the way I see it is, the men have to be involved in the story. They have a critical role to play, but the, the story needs to spell out the re true relationship between the sexes. Mm. It's a sexual story. That's why I call, I'm doing a video series now called Sex Cards, another series called Sex yeah. Signs. Hmm. Sex is at the core of our problem. It solves the war between the sexes if you can get the story straight. Story straight. If you can feel like you're a real man when you're supporting this love system, hmm. you're supporting your women and their children and nature, your role as a man becomes really solid, and you want to be that type of man. Yeah. You're no longer a killer, you become a lover. You're not a loner, you're not a, not a criminal, loner. you're not out for your yeah, own, it's, you're it's, on it's the make. It's for the man and the woman. And you're not on the make, you're not trying to yeah. bed more but, women because of a cultural yeah, But thing. I'm interesting, not the story is part of it, but I'm interested in the philosophy of sex and of, of the relationships, because and part of the philosophy is that there is no absolute equality in nature. If you look closely at any part of nature, it's not equal. There's always a type of imbalance. The uh, notion of equality mm -hmm. arises in the political, legal arena where you have to say the sexes are equal. 
It's not so in nature, I don't think. So the great denouement of the story is that why is it that the women are returning? Because the men reached the limit of bloodlust in the thermonuclear Armageddon. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do it. They couldn't shoot that bullet. It was just too mad. And so the world drew back from it. And the women were rising by that point. And the world had been through too many wars and too much destruction. And it, the men finally tired out. It's like the end of major conflicts, like the Lebanese War, 19 mm -hmm. years. People just got worn out. And that war was supported by supply lines for many countries. It just wore out. It reached this critical breaking point. And I think in enough parts of the world, the blood lust hit the wall. And so, especially in Europe, so women rose in power in Europe, they rose in power in the United States and other countries, and they, they're rising since. And if we tell the story, the story of when they had the communion, when they were the center of the yeah. human community, the loving center, and everyone had a beautiful role, and that you tell them this story from this oral community on the shores of the southern seas, and they realize, ah, the story of the, the taking away of the communion, of the knowledge, and it's now coming to its conclusion. And so how do we get the world of 2050 with all these wonderful properties? It's this story. It's the telling of the story and the rise of the power of women back as the center of the community, yeah. and all that, what that implies. It's a woman focal story that is supported by men because it's good for the whole community, and it's her story, not his story. So, are we finally witnessing the sunset of male patriarchy? Were the excesses of Genghis Khan's Rape of Asia and the 20th century's planet-girdling wars the bookends to this destructive epoch of male hegemony? Is the bloodlust that rent asunder the fabric of early tribal community finally running its course? Is there a powerful and transformative story that we, and you, dear listener, could tell the world to begin that return to a healthy planet for all of us monkeys? Find us on the web at levityzone.com and find us and subscribe in iTunes by searching for the words Levity Zone.